Hello, everyone. We're almost nearing the end of our journey, but not quite. We're here to find out more about the Marshalls here uh, on Chicago Reacts. Again, my name is Kit. We're on this fantastic journey to learn more about the Marshalls that helped build Napoleon's empire up and what happened to him as soon as Napoleon went into his exile. Sit back, relax, and let's enjoy Epic Histories Part 4, Napoleon's Marshalls. <laughs> Part four. Terror belly. Terror belly. Decus pacis. Decus pacis. Terror in war. Terror. Ornament in peace. Ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's battle. In France, the title of marshal or maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But old Napoleon but in brought it back! In 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals. With expert guidance from Lieutenant Colonel Remy Porte, former chief historian of the French Army. And I'm so looking forward to when we get the chance to cover Marshal Ney. Maybe, maybe they're going to save him for last. I do hope so. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brun, Serrouillet, Kellerman. Grouchy, Grouchy, wrongly, Poniatowski, Jordan, wrongly accused. Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont, Saint Cyr, Oudinot, Victor, and Murat. You're right, you blind bastard. Who could be a more fitting video sponsor than Napoleon Souvenirs? Oh, okay. This is the interesting. Shop for fans of the Napoleonic era. Since 2010, the team at NapoleonSouvenirs.com has offered the finest quality gifts and souvenirs for those who adore this dramatic period of history. Okay. All right. No aspect of the Napoleonic era has been forgotten. With busts and statuettes of the Emperor himself, Napoleon-themed champagne, and Ooh. stunning replicas of Napoleonic swords and pistols, as well as uniforms and flags of the Grand d'Armée and Imperial Guard, and even the baton of a maréchal. You can visit their online wow, store that's at cool. napoleonsouvenirs.com, or if you're lucky enough to be in Paris, visit the Boutique Napoleon in person. Vive l'Empereur! And thank you to napoleonsouvenirs.com. You know, that's cool. That is really cool. And um, I actually have um, a Game of Thrones replica of Robert Baratheon's Warhammer, um, I have, my, of course, my, uh, I, I have a sword that I, um, I think it was I don't know, so, so long ago. I, I bought it in Chinatown. Um, then it's, it's just only a hundred dollar sword, but, uh, one of those replica swords would be really, really, really nice. Um, but I assume they're not built for sword fighting. So if you have one of these replicas, don't use it for sword fighting, but that is cool. But how many of you? would go to napoleonsouvenirs.com. Not only that, you're also helping out Epic History, but at the same time, too, would you order a Marshall's baton? Would you have a baton in your presence? And if you actually have ordered from this place, uh, tell us what you ordered. Uh, it would be a fun way to get the conversation started. I, I, I think this is cool. I, I like it. I, I would actually order the baton if, you know, I ever... You know, I'm pretty sure shipping and costs cost a little bit, but nonetheless, it looks cool. For sponsoring this video. Nine. Marshal Bessier. Mm, if I had Bessier with me at Waterloo, my guard would have brought me victory. Huh. All right. Seems to be well respected. Jean Baptiste Bessier was the son of a surgeon, with a relatively prosperous upbringing in southwestern France. Killed in action. Oh, wow. When the French Revolution began, he volunteered for the National Guard, and was sent to Paris to join the King's Constitutional Guard, along with his old school friend, Georges Murat. 
<laughs> they were friends. This unit was soon disbanded, <laughs> but Bessières remained in Paris and was among the soldiers defending the Tuileries Palace when it was stormed by the mob on the 10th of August 1792. In the aftermath, he needed to get out of Paris in a hurry, so he volunteered to fight on the Pyrenees front. His bravery and good sense won him a commission in the 22nd Chasseurs, and he distinguished himself at the Battle of Boulou. Transferred to Italy, his friendship with Murat got him noticed by the army commander, General Bonaparte, who was impressed enough to make him commander of his new bodyguard, known as Les Guides de Bonaparte. Hmm. Bessières distinguished himself as a cavalry commander in Italy, and later Egypt, winning promotion to brigadier and loyally supporting Napoleon at every turn. He became one of the few men that Napoleon regarded as a true friend. Hmm. When Napoleon became first consul of France in 1799, he rewarded Bessières with command of the elite consular guard cavalry, which he led with devastating effect at Marengo the next year. In 1804, Bessières became a marshal, less for any great military achievement than for being a loyal member of Napoleon's inner circle. Bessières himself was well-liked, kind, well-mannered and generous, a pious Catholic and social conservative who liked to powder his hair in the old style. Oh, okay. His young right. wife, Marie-Jeanne, was also a favourite at court, doted on by Napoleon and Empress Josephine. Oh, okay. So they, 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 they were that couple that everyone liked, like, oh, hey, what's going on, buddy? Where you been at? In 1805, <laughs> Bessières commanded the Imperial Guard. In December that year, at the Battle of Austerlitz, he played a crucial role repelling the Russian Guard at the battle's climax. At Eylau in 1807, his squadron supported Murat's mass cavalry charge and made their own disciplined attacks to cover his withdrawal. However, Bessières' opportunities for glory were limited. Napoleon always held the guard back as his last reserve, as at Friedland. In 1808, Bessières received his first major independent command in northern Spain. That May, the country erupted in revolt against the French. Bessières reacted quickly and decisively, securing key towns and roads. He then Again, gotta repeat myself. Invading Spain. Epic disaster. Never should have happened. Never should have got involved. Attacked Spanish forces at Medina de Rio Seco, winning a crushing victory against an enemy that outnumbered him two to one. But once the immediate crisis had passed, he hesitated and failed to exploit his victory. Hmm. When Napoleon arrived in Spain, Bessières was given command of the reserve cavalry a role he retained for the war against Austria in 1809. In May, Bessières and his cavalry were among the first across the Danube, with Massena occupying the village of Aspern on his left, and Lann holding Essling on the right. When the Austrian commander, Archduke Charles, launched a massive and unexpected counterattack, Bessières, outnumbered four to one, made a series of desperate charges helping to save the army from disaster. It came at a high cost. He died in combat. Bessières and his cavalry performed bravely. But that night, a long-running feud with Marshal Lann nearly came to blows when Lann accused Bessières of hanging back. The matter went no further, as Lann was fatally wounded the next day. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Bessières commanded the cavalry again at Wagram, leading a major attack to cover Massena's redeployment to the left wing. As the charge began, a cannonball killed Bessières' horse and injured his leg. A rumour reached the Imperial Guard that Bessières was dead. Some old veterans began to weep for their old commander, until they were assured he was only wounded. That was quite a cannonball, Napoleon told Bessières. It reduced my guard to tears. <laughs> As a devout Catholic, Bessières was critical of Napoleon's divorce from Empress Josephine. Really? Leading to a short spell out of favor. Huh. 
You know, I, I, I find it interesting, like, really holding to those values, like, I mean, especially when you're involved in that amount of politics, that, that high echelon of politics. That's, um, that's something, especially running out of favor when uh, earlier on in the video, it's showing that Napoleon and his wife Josephine really favored him and his wife. In 1811, he was sent back to Spain to command the Army of the North. He found an impossible situation widespread insurgency and insufficient troops and supplies. He wrote bluntly to Napoleon, stating that the French must give up territory, something the Emperor would never allow. He spoke the truth. For all his piety and refined manners, Bessier ordered his share of executions and reprisals in his attempt to pacify northern Spain, brutal methods used by many French commanders in this conflict. Later that year, he joined forces with Marshal Massena's Army of Portugal to take on Wellington's army at the Battle of Fuentes de Onoro, but was widely blamed for refusing to send in his cavalry to support Massena's attacks. Mm. Unfortunately for Napoleon, this was typical of how many marshals behaved in his absence. They'd rather watch another marshal fail than help them to win all the glory. Wow. In 1812, Petty. Petty. Bessier accompanied Napoleon into Russia, commanding his guard cavalry. Since the guard was kept in reserve, he saw little action until the retreat, when he led the advance guard, clearing a path for the survivors. The disaster in Russia left Bessier severely demoralized, but he was resolved to do his duty, now serving once more as Napoleon's cavalry commander in Marshal Murat's absence. Right. Because Murat... On the 1st of May, 1813, uh, Bessie... Yeah, because Murat, I think, at that point, was starting to really become too much of an egomaniac. Yeah, was scouting enemy positions before the Battle of Lützen, when a cannonball hit him in the chest, killing him instantly. Oh, His that's... death robbed Napoleon of a dependable commander and one of his last remaining friends. Hmm. It is surely a great loss for you and your children, Napoleon wrote to his widow, but an even greater one for me. 8. Marshal MacDonald No relation to McDonald's. I know, I know, that was a terrible joke. Poor taste, I'm sorry. Good and brave, but unlucky. <laughs> Jacques Did he get shot too? A lot? A Scotsman who supported Bonnie Prince Charlie's bid to seize the British throne in 1745. After this ended in defeat at Culloden, the family fled to France. Okay. Inspired by tales of the Trojan War, Macdonald chose a military life and became a lieutenant in Dillon's Irish Regiment, a French unit made up mostly of Irish émigrés. Hmm. In the Revolutionary Wars, he won a reputation as a hard-working, intelligent and brave officer and served as aide-de-camp to General de Maurier, commanding the Army of the North. He distinguished himself in that general's famous victory at Jemap, paving the way for rapid promotion from lieutenant to general in just two years. Oh, wow. He led promotion. his division well during campaigns in Holland and Germany, and formed a close bond with one of France's most successful commanders of this period, General Moreau. Hmm. In 1798, he was sent to Rome as governor, and later commanded the army of Naples. Summoned north the following year to reinforce Moreau's army of Italy, he was nearly killed in a skirmish with Austrian cavalry, and while still suffering from his wounds, his army was defeated at the Trebia by a larger coalition force commanded by the great Russian general Suvorov. But Macdonald's own conduct won approval from General Bonaparte, among others. Later that year, he assisted Napoleon's seizure of power in the coup of 18 Brumaire, ensuring the loyalty of the troops at Versailles. He was rewarded with an army command in Switzerland, and that winter led his men through the Alps to attack the Austrians in Italy. His march was far more challenging and dangerous than Napoleon's, but was never immortalized in quite the same way. Right, so while Napoleon gets that picture, the guy who actually really did the tough work 
didn't get immortalized. So, wow, way to take someone's thunder, Napoleon. In 1804, MacDonald's former commander, General Moreau, was arrested and charged with involvement in a plot to assassinate Napoleon. Oh, wow. MacDonald stood up for his friend's reputation, an act of loyalty typical of the man, but disastrous for his career. Yeah, buddy. Moreau was exiled. MacDonald was placed under police surveillance and returned what? to his country estate in disgrace. Five years passed before Napoleon, desperate for experienced senior commanders, asked him to serve as military advisor to his 27-year-old stepson, Prince Eugène, now commanding the Army of Italy. Macdonald and Eugène worked well together, driving back the Austrians, and by an awesome feat of marching, joined Napoleon near Vienna, in time for the Battle of Wagram. The second day of the battle was Macdonald's moment. Entrusted by the Emperor with the main attack on the enemy centre, he formed his troops into a giant, open-backed square, and advanced into a hail of fire. What on earth? Napoleon, watching through his telescope, exclaimed several times, What a brave man! What a brave man! Macdonald's costly attack helped to secure a great victory. The next day, Napoleon went to find him on the battlefield, and greeted him with the words, Let us be friends from now. You have acted valiantly and given me the greatest services. On the battlefield of your glory, where I owe you so large a part of yesterday's success, I make you a Marshal of France. You have long deserved it. In addition, Ma That was a smart political move on Napoleon's part, I guess, so that he could have an like, experienced commander. Macdonald received the title Duke of Taranto and a large pension. But as time would prove, his loyalty remained to France, not to Napoleon. Oh, Macdonald okay. spent an unhappy year in Catalonia, commanding troops in what he regarded as an immoral war. Really interesting. Uh, and again, I think uh, from all of our previous other videos covering uh, Napoleon, for, and even from the other reactors as well, um, Spain it was a disaster. In his memoirs, he even praised the noble and courageous resistance of the Spanish. In 1812, he was given command of 10th Corps for the invasion of Russia. This corps, composed of German troops and reluctant Prussian allies, guarded the left flank of the invasion and had a relatively quiet campaign. In December, the Prussians suddenly agreed an armistice with the Russians leaving the loyal remnants of Macdonald's corps to fight their way back to Poland. Wow. By 1813, Napoleon relied on Macdonald as one of his senior marshals. In August, he gave him command of the forces keeping watch on General Blücher's army of Silesia. But when Macdonald advanced across the Katzbach River, torrential rain and flooding caused chaos among his troops, just as they encountered Blücher's army. Blücher launched an immediate attack, and Macdonald's army was routed. Thousands of his new conscripts surrendered or deserted. Hundreds were driven into the river itself. Macdonald took full responsibility for the disaster, though his lack of cavalry and some bad luck. Wow, 30,000 casualties. 22,000 for the Allies. Oh, that's a lot of, uh, that's, that, that's a lot of carnage. We're also to blame. Napoleon certainly continued to respect Macdonald's military judgment. He continued to command 11th Corps and was in the thick of the fighting at Leipzig two months later. Macdonald was with the rear guard when the French retreat began and was shocked to see the chaos that engulfed the army. When the Elster Bridge was blown too early, he himself was trapped on the wrong side of the river and just managed to swim to safety under enemy fire. Macdonald continued to serve Napoleon as a loyal and reliable commander throughout the 1814 campaign, effectively serving as his deputy at several key moments. Unlike most marshals, Macdonald was never under Napoleon's spell, 
and always spoke his mind to the Emperor. This in itself was a valuable service, though it sometimes led to heated arguments. Perhaps inevitably, in April, it was Macdonald and Ney who took the lead in confronting Napoleon with the facts of his situation. The war was lost, and he must abdicate. Napoleon named Macdonald as one of the three men who would negotiate with the Allies, telling his foreign minister, the Marquis de Colincourt, Macdonald does not like me, but he is a man of his word, of high principles, and he can be relied on. Wow. In their last meeting, a few days later, Napoleon told Macdonald, I did not know you well. I was prejudiced against you. I have done so much for so many others who have abandoned me. And you, who owe me nothing, have remained faithful. I appreciate your loyalty. Too late. That's the thing, Macdon man. You know, sometimes you find a friend in an unlikely spot or you get to know somebody and you realize, hey, I didn't treat you right. So always be nice and kind to people as, as much as you can, because sometimes people can be jerks too. Donald was kept on as a military advisor by France's restored Bourbon monarchy. He continued to speak his mind, so much so that Louis XVIII nicknamed him his outspokenness. During the Hundred Days, Macdonald remained loyal to the king and attempted to rally troops to fight against Napoleon. When he saw this was futile, he escorted the king to safety in Belgium, then returned to Paris, where he refused to meet with Napoleon. After the defeat at Waterloo, he was put in charge of demobilizing the last elements of Napoleon's Grande Armée, wow. and helped many officers to escape arrest by the Bourbons. Macdonald was a methodical, reliable, if unspectacular, commander. But he distinguished himself, above all, by his lack of vanity or personal ambition, his complete loyalty to France, and his willingness to speak his mind, virtues that were all too rare among Napoleon's marshals. So basically, if I'm gonna compare him to anyone, he's like Rogel Dorn, he speaks his mind. <laughs> Here's Rogel Dorn right here. Marshal McDonald, AKA Rogel Dorn. <laughs> Seven, Marshal Massena. He came alive when surrounded by danger, when defeated, he was always ready to begin again, as if he was in fact the victor. André Massena was born in Nice, at that time not technically part of France, but of the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. His father, a shopkeeper, died when he was young. So he ran away to sea, then at 17, enlisted in the French army. He was quickly made a sergeant, but a commoner could rise no higher in the Royal Army. So after 14 years service, he quit. When the French Revolution began, he re-enlisted in a local volunteer battalion. Massena, supremely self-confident and unfazed by any challenge, was elected to command the battalion and led it with success against the Austrians on the Piedmontese front. Despite his lack of education, he proved an instinctive combat leader. He was soon promoted to brigadier, and after leading a successful attack at the Siege of Toulon, was made General of Division. He won an impressive victory over the Austrians at Loano in 1795, and when the Army of Italy's commander, General Scherer, resigned over lack of support from the government in Paris, many expected Massena to replace him. Instead, the job went to the 26-year-old General Bonaparte, 11 years younger and much less experienced than Massena, but with far better political connections. Nevertheless, Napoleon and Massena worked together brilliantly. Massena commanded his advance guard and played a major role in several of his early victories. In reports, Napoleon described Massena as active, tireless, audacious. He won so many battles that Napoleon acclaimed him l'enfant gâté de la victoire, the spoiled child of victory. Massena I, again, it's all it, it's it's really incredible how Napoleon met a lot of his commanders in the early days of his political career as as being a uh, 
uh, a commander, especially in Italy. Like, he meets all these people in Italy, almost. Or, or, or at least as he's getting started with his career. Vienna was, however, notorious for extorting vast sums from the local Italians. <laughs> often while his own troops went hungry and without pay. Oh, so, so basically you lived a high life while your boys were out there starving and struggling. Like a typical aristocrat. In 1798, Massena received his first independent command the army of Switzerland. The next spring, after French defeats on the Rhine and in Italy, responsibility for the defence of France lay in his hands. Rather than wait to be encircled, he attacked and won a brilliant oh, wow. victory over Austrian and Russian forces at the Battle of Zurich. Okay, all Rewarded right. Rewarded with command of the army of Italy, Massena led a heroic defense of Genoa in 1800. He was eventually starved into surrender, but his stubborn defense bought Napoleon enough time to cross the Alps and defeat the Austrians at Marengo. At Marengo. Physically exhausted by this last ordeal and surrounded by accusations of corruption, Massena was recalled to Paris and went into semi-retirement. Okay. When he was made a marshal by Napoleon in 1804, he seemed distinctly underwhelmed, and on being congratulated, remarked, there are 14 of us. But... So, wait, you thought it was all, all gonna belong to you? What an arrogant bastard. Massena was one of the few marshals who'd proved themselves in independent command, making him a priceless asset to Napoleon. In 1805, he was recalled to active service, and given command of the Army of Italy in the war against the Third Coalition. Massena kept Archduke Charles's army busy in Italy, while the Emperor won his great victories at Ulm and Austerlitz. In 1806, Massena oversaw the occupation of the Kingdom of Naples, ordering brutal reprisals against local resistance. Oh. In 1807, he commanded Fifth Corps in Poland, but his role covering Warsaw meant he missed the major battles of Eilau and Friedland. Hmm. Later that year, while out hunting with the Emperor and his entourage at Fontainebleau, he was accidentally shot in the face and lost the use of an eye. Napoleon, a notoriously bad shot, was to blame, but the lo So... <laughs> Napoleon shot him. <laughs> Yeah, hunting accident. Okay, buddy. Oil Marshal Berthier claimed responsibility. The war against Austria in 1809 saw Massena back near his best. His corps formed the vanguard for the crossing of the Danube and fought ferociously to hold the village of Aspern against an overwhelming Austrian onslaught. Massena was everywhere, displaying his usual coolness under fire and when ordered to retreat, ensured his troops pulled back across the river in good order. The battle was a defeat, but Massena had been superb. Together, he and the Emperor oversaw preparations for the next attempt to cross the Danube six weeks later. The Austrians were waiting for them at the Battle of Wagram. Because of a riding accident a few days earlier, Massena had to command his corps from a carriage. He made a fine target for Austrian gunners, but was still able to organize a complex... So this guy in a carriage, commanding a, a, a battlefield. Uh, <laughs> way to make yourself into a target, buddy. Complex ...redeployment of his corps at the height of the battle, covered by Marshal Bessier's cavalry charge. Massena's bold maneuver secured the French left flank and won further praise from Napoleon. Massena, already ennobled as the Duke of Rivoli, received a new title, Prince of Essling, and another less welcome reward, command of French forces for the invasion of Portugal. Oh Massena boy. Massena was deeply and reluctant to go. And this is what I remember, especially from the last time we watched uh, Napoleon's Vietnam, Spain, 1809 to 1811. Check that out when you're done watching this. Is that uh, he was notoriously corrupt and did a lot of shady things while he was in Spain. And complained bitterly about his appointment. He was showing clear signs of exhaustion and was plagued by rheumatism and bad lungs. Oh, wow. 
When he arrived in Spain, General Foy observed, He's only 52, but he looks more than 60. He's lost weight and has begun to stoop. His glance, since the accident in which he lost an eye, has lost its keenness. His subordinates, already underwhelmed by his appearance, were outraged that the Marshal also decided to bring along his mistress, poorly disguised as an officer of dragoons. Yeah, okay. All right, buddy. Napoleon, I don't know what you were thinking with this guy. The French invasion of Portugal proved a disaster, undone by Wellington's scorched earth tactics. Yeah, another thing, too, I, I, you know, I, I wonder what it was like when they discovered, like, hey, wait a minute, you're not a dude and you're not an officer of dragoons. No, I'm not. I'm the, uh, I'm the marshal's mistress. Hostile population and terrain. <laughs> And the Senate. That's probably not how she sounded. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. ...his own lethargic leadership. His core commanders, especially Marshal Ney, were scathing of his conduct. At Busaco, Massena squandered lives with an unnecessary frontal attack on a strong British position. When he reached Lisbon, he found the city protected by new fortifications, the impregnable lines of Torres Vedras. Massena waited outside Lisbon for reinforcements that never came, while sickness and guerrilla raids took their toll on his army. Five months later, he recrossed the mountains back into Spain, leaving a string of devastated villages behind him. The next summer, at Fuentes de Oñoro, Massena attacked Wellington's army once more, and despite much hard fighting, again failed to win a clear victory. He blamed Marshal Bessier for his lack of support. But the Emperor's patience was at an end. He sent Marshal Marmont to replace Massena. And when they next met, greeted him with the cutting words, So, Prince of Essling, you are no longer Massena. <laughs> Massena's health was now in steep decline. He never held a major command again though he was recalled in 1813 to supervise a military district in southern France. He died after a long illness in 1817. In his prime, Massena was a superb commander, incisive and dangerous, but he was past his best by the time he became a marshal. Nevertheless, there were enough sparks of his old brilliance to worry his adversaries. The Duke of Wellington once remarked, when Massena was opposed to me in the field, I never slept comfortably. Yep, that's come from the good old Duke of Wellington. Whom fights sitting on his butt. Bessier, MacDonald, Massena. 20 down, 6 to go. Join us for the next part of Napoleon's Marshals as we reveal our top 6, coming soon. Okay, well, uh, these are a little bit more in detail with these individuals, and... Uh, you know, you realize that a lot of these historical figures that we read in the history books are, um, you know, they, they, they show what they've done. Or either that, I think in a lot of school books, they, they barely cover them. We, we see them in the pictures. But, you know, when you really take a deep dive and look into their personal lives and their history, they're, they're complex, brilliant individuals with their own fair share of flaws. And uh, again, looking at their military capabilities, it's, it's no surprise that Napoleon was able to build such a massive empire, but at the same time, too, what led to its decline was the pride and vanity of a lot of these marshals. So, uh, we didn't get a chance to cover Marshal Ney yet. I wonder if we'll see it in uh, part five or six. We will see. Uh, my name is Kit. I hope you've been enjoying our coverage of uh, Epic History's uh, Napoleon's Marshals. Uh, tune in next time where we'll cover part five.